Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Longo, and I'll be your host for today's presentation. I'd like to thank you for joining another Flycast Partners webinar. Today's webinar is back practice best practices for evaluating service management software in 2018, and it's the first one of these that we've done in 2018. And of course, being presented by none other than Greg Gilda. Greg has been with Flycast Partners pretty much since its inception, has been responsible for virtually hundreds and hundreds of new tool implementations. He's been in the IT industry for almost 25 years and has provided ITIL consultative skills to numerous clients regarding ITIL best practices and critical success factors required for smooth implementation and operation. Now, we have a ton of people trying to sign in right now, folks, and I want to welcome all those of you trying to get in here. So we'll we'll stall a little bit and tell you a little bit more about Flycast Partners. Before we get started, Greg, uh, Flycast Partners is here to deliver a seriously amazing IT experience founded and staffed by personnel that have many years of experience in the IT space. We took the best ideas from these collective experiences and added the best components necessary to grow and become a leading value you added reseller in the North American IT market. We offer best-in-class implementation services and training in ITSM, ITAM, workload automation, enterprise service man management, capacity optimization and cost control, artificial intelligence, all using nothing but ITIL best practice. Our professional services can easily scale up or down to meet the IT needs of any organization, regardless of how big you are, the, how complex you are, or what budgetary restrictions you may have. We offer implementation services both on-site and remote, as well as the necessary training to reinforce your company's long-term IT success. Our ongoing remote administration and support service offerings will enable your organization to focus on your normal day-to-day -day operations, saving you both precious time and money. I encourage you to reach out to us at 844-FLYCAST, that's 844-359-2278, or simply visit our website and talk to us on our chat. Talk to any one of our ITSM specialists standing by for you. Look around on our website for things that might interest to you, whether it be white papers or data sheets, or look, we have a remote training ITIL class. Those of you interested in that class can register directly online and pay online to take the class with our own in-house personnel, our own Flycast Partners personnel. You'll take the same course we do using our representative Chuck Spencer as an instructor. So if you're interested in, in taking a, a great ITIL class, one that you know that when you're done, you're going to truly understand and pass your test, this is the course for you. So check it out on our website. We also offer a variety of different tool options for you to research. We have different process uh, offerings that may help you and your organization get more organized and try to get everybody on all the stakeholders on the same page. A variety of other training in our training center from anything from big data tools to business productivity tools, cloud computing, digital marketing, mobile software development, project management, a plethora of project management courses. So I encourage you to go out on our website and take a look at some of the offerings we have here at Flycast Partners that may be a benefit to you or your coworkers. Workers. We do have a, quite a few upcoming webinars over the next several months, so take a look at some of the things that we have going on. Those of you that uh, have seen our, our full series or are interested in our full series, we do have our full series coming up next month, so you might want to sign up for that in March. Uh, we start with a full as a tool. Uh, for problem management, we do change management, uh, service desk creates ad hocracy, uh, Data soon parted for CMDB, so take a look at some of those. Now, without further delay, it looks like we've got quite the audience that have joined us and are still joining us. So, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you anyway. Thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your day, by the way, to uh, to talk with us a little bit about our about our discussion. Oops, it looks like my screen went forward one when I didn't want it to. Today, we're going to be talking about how to select an ITSM software solution, and, of course, there are lots of tools out there to choose from. We're not really talking about specific tools in this case, more about the feature sets, the capabilities, 
right? The benefits that they bring you. What's a feature? Just a button. What's the benefit? What it does for you? Right? So I want to talk about how how you actually can use the features and capabilities of the solutions and things to look for when you when you might be shopping for one. From a general overview standpoint, we'll talk about some signs that you might need one. Right? And these signs may be showing up with flashing neon signs above them, or they may be a little more subtle, but they're probably happening, some or all of these things, so that might be a sign that you need something new. Things to consider from a feature standpoint in solutions like these, so when you're picking them, what stuff are you really trying to focus on? You know, what stuff really matters? Uh, where, where to start that whole process, right? And anything else that you might want to think about sort of along the way as you do this. So, we'll start with our, you may need a new idea, some solution if, ta-da! You seem to have a little too much spare time these days. This is definitely something that can suck up an inordinate amount of time. It is a tool, absolutely, right, that you're looking for. Tools are just that. They don't really create process. They enable a process that you've set forth. So you want to think about the process and a lot of other pieces that go into it. Those things can take time. There's no question about it, preparing and getting ready for this. Yeah, but abundance of cash. A lot of people, of course, have tons of cash lying around. And they're just looking for ways to set it on fire and stay warm this winter. <laughs> Not that these tools are going to be setting your cash on fire. They're obviously here to help you get over the humps and bumps that we encounter every day. But now well, these, these things, people look at it and say, oh, wow, we got some cash to burn. Let's go buy a new tool. Maybe you're just curious about discovering new things. So you're, you're interested in what's going on in your organization and you'd like to find out the hard way. Boy, and nothing... Nothing like installing a new one of these solutions to help you come to grips with how people are doing things. Sometimes it's, look, cover my eyes. I don't want to look. I don't want to know. Don't tell me as long as we're getting the work done. All right? That's a great discovery process. Usually it's none of those things, right? It's other things like the stuff we're about to discuss. You might need a new solution, all kidding aside, if timing is important. And when we say timing, we really are talking about the fact that your support folks might be taking too long to resolve issues, right? might be ending up with unhappy customers. Now, how they're telling you that is another thing we'll talk about a little later. But if folks are taking too long to get information back to you, then that's, that's an issue. If you have folks that you have assigned work from your service desk, who is the dispatch authority, those folks can dispatch as well as fix things. When they send out that information, we need to know if those folks are working on it or not. We need updates. We need ways of tracking that detail. Customers are going to be calling and asking about how their service is coming. We need to be able to provide an answer. Usually, we can waste time with agents who are working on things simultaneously. So we have lots of folks in the organization all working at the same time. And sometimes customers love to do this with the shotgun approach, right? I'm going to call five different people and open a help desk ticket. And that'll get my attention. For sure, people will focus on me. I am the squeaky wheel. But with agents spinning their wheels all working on the same thing from different angles, finally, eventually, they'll all come together in the tunnel and go, hey, I was digging it from that side, man. So, and if they're not aware of what everybody's doing, that's an issue, too. You need a place where people can kind of collaborate on what's happening. Requests for service might fall through the cracks. Pshaw, I say. That never happens. Right? These are the things where, oops. Whatever happened with that request, and the customer will always remember, right, that they put the request out there. They're the ones waiting for the service. For all of us providing the service, we're kind of waiting for customers to come to us, and depending on how busy our organizations are, it can be a blur of people and calls every day that are coming to us. But for them, they're the one. that's the one thing they were asking for. And if they fall through the cracks because we can't keep track, then we're in trouble. Clients could leave. Now, depending on the kind of business you run, you may not have a choice about you know your customer they're, they're the people that are going to come to your service desk because they work inside your building but other folks that we work with certainly and that are out there manage service providers you know, colleges other places where there is kind of a central providership or there may be disparate separate providerships like in a, in a managed service providing uh, scenario you you may have choices about where you go to get your services provided if you're a customer and you'd want to be able to provide the most timely responses that you can tools can help you reach this kind of result. We're going to talk about how some of that can happen too. You might need a new solution if knowledge is important. Now, obviously, if we're running service desks and running our IT organizations, we're all saying, well, of course knowledge is important. 
But where do we store it? Where, where does it stay? Right? Even if knowledge is not a huge thing in the industry in terms of how many people it helps, if you look at industry statistics, right? Knowledge helps between what, five and 8% of, of all the customers out there having a knowledge base. So it's a pretty small percentage, a small slice. Not that a little help isn't gonna be some help. Right? But managing the knowledge when it leaves your organization is usually important too. Where does it go when people leave? Well, we have to make it up because they didn't transfer their knowledge to anyone when they left, they just left. Knowledge gets scattered throughout organizations. Lots of people have pockets of it, but you need a place to, to organize it, at least to store who has the knowledge. The brain drain is one of the biggest reasons why we used to be able to support something and we can't now, because the people left. And so, sorry, bear with us while we come up to speed and train a new cashier. We didn't expect them to be gone that quickly. When that stuff happens, the knowledge that those folks know go with them. And in many cases, some of that knowledge can be highly esoteric, right? Very specific to a particular kind of product or tool. And if it's not documented someplace, well, you know, clearly they might like that idea because you always have to come to them. But documenting that knowledge someplace means that you have a central repository for it and tools can become the location for that. When knowledge doesn't get transferred between your technicians in an appropriate way, that might be non-existent or slow. Oftentimes a sign that you need a, a place to store that info. And that way everybody can come up to speed, even if they're reading from a script to do it, right? They can at least look at the knowledge and say, yes, this is how we solve this issue. I only know that because I read it, but it's still how we solve this issue. Each, each time we create a fix for something, we don't have to go back to the well and say, let's create the fix again from scratch because we fixed it once. We understand how to do it. We should have steps. And oftentimes our knowledge comes in every single day that is like, look, new steps on how to fix something. So knowledge, if you have a knowledge-centric system or service that you're providing, KCS, those knowledge base articles can be written on the fly sometimes, right? Because the knowledge is coming in live and we're fixing things live and we just figured out how to work it out and we're documenting that and that becomes our, our new training mantra for all of our help desk staff. Use this method to fix all the rest of the people that are calling in until we can get a permanent fix. Don't treat them like they're brand new because they're not. Every one of them is not brand new. By the second or third one, we're going, hey, I've seen this before. I've seen this movie. I know how it ends. Happy customers might be important to you. That might be a sign for getting a new tool, right? Customer satisfaction and agent performance is oftentimes difficult to measure. Now, agent performance is especially hard because oftentimes we don't even cut a ticket. That's, that's, that's a whole other situation, right? But the tool can be at the, at the root of that too, if it's not easy to get my information logged. But if we work without tickets, then, you know, how do I drop off my laundry without getting a ticket? I, or my car, I have some record of the fact that I've got some work to be done. So it's hard to get folks to log tickets sometimes, but you need to have that information tracked. In the end, I need to be able to see how well we've done at serving our folks, how well have we done at helping them. So it'd be helpful if the tool could ask these kinds of questions. Customer SAT scores might be declining if we're able to take them at all. Sometimes the customer SAT score is anecdotal. We're listening to it out in the field. People, people are not happy with the help desk, or as they sometimes call it, the helpless desk. We can hear those murmurs. It'd be good to put our finger on that pulse. Be careful what you get back, because you know, folks <laughs> sometimes are very willing to share their thoughts if you give them a venue to do it, but that's good, because you want to have that information so you can steer your ship and say, look, we're sorry, we're off course. But we have ways of correcting that now. Customers might be increasingly expressing frustration when <laughs> requesting support, right? That's the help this, help this desk thing. They have to make contact multiple times. And this usually implies we're not documenting our knowledge, but it also implies the customer on the other end of that is going, this is the fifth time I've called them this week. Now, if, if you're the person on the other end, right? if you're calling your cable company because it's the fifth time this week they told you to just reset the cable box, no, just unplug it and plug it back in and it'll work again. Eventually they're like, why did they just keep telling me this? Why don't they fix it permanently? These kinds of things are things we should find out from our customer. And if our tool doesn't provide a way to survey or get that information back, we have a hard time steering you know, the mighty ship of process to, to aim at that stuff. Data might be important to you. Might be important to have key information about exactly how you're delivering services or exactly what the services are that you're delivering. You can figure, figure that out. And to get data, 
the documented requests have to be put somewhere. We need to store information. We need to understand what fields have to be gathered so that the service providers that we use, and these service providers are probably working for us, right? They're probably inside the company in the data center somewhere or have offices outside of it as DBAs or what have you. Those service providers are still contracted to us to provide services through what we call an operational level agreement. We still provide services to our customers on service level agreements. But when people ask for things, we're invoking through our service level agreement, those operational level agreements to our support staff who may in turn invoke underpinning contracts to our vendors. But if none of that gets documented, <laughs> if we don't have any of that written down anywhere, if we don't have even the request written down, then we can't even invoke all of that nicely laid set of plans, right? So you've got to have a way of laying down and creating the plans that you need, of course. But you also need a way of documenting the fact that we even had a request. You need a system of record for this. You have to understand the sources of those most common requests. So who keeps requesting which services? Which division keeps asking for the same things over and over again? Awesome. That's good data to know because now we understand that when people call from a certain division of the company, they're probably calling about whatever this thing is. Is that a problem? Is there an underlying root cause as to why they keep calling all the time or they're getting frustrated? Without the right kind of tool meshing that kind of info together for you, you can't make those kinds of decisions. Decisions. You need a way to get data out of the solution. Tickets can get bounced between service providers. <laughs> this is so common in their, inside of our IT shops, at least, and other service providers in the company. But what's weird is in the real world, this really doesn't happen, right? We do, we do as Rich was talking about, we do a, a discussion about, uh, about the service desk. Right? Without a service desk creates an ad hocracy. It's a, a presentation I deliver. But one of the key elements in there is that when we, when we talk about getting services for our homes, we don't accidentally call the power company if we have a water leak. But somehow, when we get these tickets logged inside of IT, we always use the same help desk type categories, hardware, software, network. So we don't know how to create the categories really and we route it to the wrong people and the wrong people are somehow on the other end of, this isn't us, it's not us doing it, it's somebody else. The ticket gets kicked around all the time to different people because we don't have a way of properly categorizing or getting those tickets routed through a tool in the organization. Decisive data, things that we can use to make decisions, right? real decision-based data, like time to resolve or what's our backlog of tickets or how many tickets are carried over month to month. Sometimes that's not recorded in any tool at all, right? Sometimes that's an email. I don't know, look through the emails last month and see. So having at least some idea of volume would be good to know just how many times somebody's being requested. Getting that data back out of the system is pretty vital. No ability to justify your headcount because from a bandwidth standpoint, you know, folks are working on stuff. You don't know it because they're not logging a record to say they're working on stuff, so you can't count that up. There's no record that represents the work, even if they don't do anything other than log it, even if the record just exists as a log document, they don't touch it again. You at least can count how many of those were and understand what the, what the bandwidth use is. So getting data back out of the tool, pretty vital. Many of you are probably going, finally, it's going to shut up. No, well, I'm not gonna spare you that quick. In the end, guys, though, no single rule is going to tell you what the right time is to do this. Right? There's no single thing that we just talked about. So usually it's all those things interplaying with each other. You know what? We don't have any knowledge, and it's taken a heck of a long time for us to resolve things. Those things certainly dovetail together. Lack of knowledge can oftentimes mean we're making up the solution to fix it on the fly as we're talking to the customer on the phone in that minute. It's the wrong time to have to try to make it up on the fly, right? So there's going to be a lot of things that will coalesce together and sometimes all organizations have all those pieces. So you got to do this when we're really looking organizationally to say, you know, we could clean this up and be a lot more efficient. And if we were, then we could deliver services in a little more streamlined way. Because in the end, the customer using the services, whether they're inside our company, because we can keep the payroll system up and everyone gets paid, or outside the company because we can keep the ATM machines running for our external customers, no matter what the service is, we have to be able to provide that in as efficient as way as possible. And if the systems are always down or the systems are always out, then that's not efficiency because people are fixing things all the time that should be running smoothly. We want to make true data-driven decisions. Sometimes we do that. We want to make decisions based on data. 
might be important. <laughs> Hard to get to where you're going without it. So common configurations, let's talk a little bit about how some of these tools can be set up. If we establish that we have some parameters that indicate we should get a tool, then maybe we want to think about how the tools can be based. Web-based tools are awesome because you can use them anywhere. Any place there's a web browser, you can log in and use them. And literally all web-based tools use modern web browsing technology now, HTML5 as a, you know, as a display text. So it scales nicely for handheld mobile devices. It was built you know, with that kind of mobile device in mind, really plus a few other graphical capabilities, but that was one of them, to be able to shrink the screen and have it display cleanly on any size. Client-based stuff is great. You know, most people use Outlook instead of OWA because they like the app. Apps have a certain solidity, and there are certainly tools out there that are client-based and will have a web offering. How they're hosted or serviced might be important. On-premise is kind of the assumed box that isn't in this picture. But you could also have a, a SaaS model right? Software as a service. In this case, somebody is taking care of the whole thing from soup to nuts. They're upgrading it and they're making the changes to it, etc. And you've just got them on a contract. And pass is even above that where it's a whole platform you could actually develop in it. Some software solutions that do this allow you to create your own solutions within them and then use those solutions either for your own company or say, hey, we're going to put them on the app store. <laughs> and our platform will now let us sell this app because we developed it in our company and we're going to use it for other people. We'll put it out there and people can buy it and we'll have another revenue stream. Some tools allow for that. From a getting started standpoint, what kind of features go into these? Well, they're either codeless or code required usually, which means they're either customized or configured. Right, so code required tools are usually customized, special for us because we're coding all the stuff in it and people are writing script. It's sort of the ultimate minutia in setup, right? Because with code, you can certainly control every stinking detail of what happens. But if if building a, a software tool, you know, is like it's like creating a book. Let's just pretend that we have kits where we could buy books. If I bought a book kit, I could buy them in a lot of different shapes and sizes. One of them could be look predefined sentences, and you just paste the sentences into the book. Some could be, look, letters, a stack of letters, and you stick them into the book, and you can write your book based on a bunch of, bunch of letters. And others would be, you got to place the ink on the page molecule by molecule. If you're doing software that is code-based, it's molecule by molecule, man. You've got you to write every single step. And usually that implies more time involved in maintaining the tool, sometimes a full-time developer on staff or two. Plus, you're, you're cozy with your vendor, right? because those folks are usually providing the services to make this work. Other tools are a little easier. They may be codeless, but you still have to place word by word when you're writing your book, right? Letter by letter anyway. And some tools are very easy, just a quick stroke, and you've got kind of a predefined sentence that you can write out. Obviously, in each case, you don't have as much control. Right? I can control the ink on a molecular basis. I can put it anywhere I want on the paper. But if I write whole sentences, that's a different story entirely. I have to kind of like the sentences that I have to stroke with. But by and large, those are the design concepts behind these tools, code-based or code-less. And code-less ones can come, as I said, in different sort of, sort of flavors. So you customize or you configure. The code-less ones are configured. And that means upgrades typically happen right over the top of the existing code. You just made a configuration change, but the code underneath is what gets upgraded. They're wizard-based upgrades usually with those tools. In the end, you want to think about the integration capabilities with them too, right? Even if that integration is a scripted one where you're using you know, a web, a web API of some type or a REST-based API or something, as long as we can make the tool do something with that code, right? one molecule at a time, I can instruct the tool how to behave. And usually the tools will wake up with specific commands and say, yay, I'll create a ticket or I'll update a ticket based on, based on that integration. Or it'll send data to another tool, and that other tool then has to have integration capabilities, right? It has to have the ability for something outside of itself to talk to it and say, yes, go do this. Because most tools are used to having their own interfaces talk to them. But if you're doing a two-way integration, you want to think about, hey, does the other tool also have that capability? Can, can it be talked to? 
features from an integration standpoint, single sign-on, right? Does it integrate and provide a way for me to have no additional authentication? Is that even important? People sign into so many applications anymore that it's just commonplace, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many things I sign into on my phone all the time. So it, it's really not that big of a deal, but single sign-on can sometimes be important. LDAP integration, can I pull my details out of a known source, Active Directory, a form of LDAP? is one of those possible choices, but other lightweight directory access protocols are also a piece of that puzzle. Ways of getting sources of truth about who's a legitimate user and let me authenticate against that. Tools can support that or, or not, things that you wanna think about. Integration with your monitoring tools. Remember that integration can even be as simple as email. And a lot of these tools will support emailing in a ticket. If I email you at a particular address tool, the tool will create a ticket and then it will send somebody a notification that said, Psst, I just created the ticket. If it's a human, then it'll send them a notice that says, I just built a ticket. If it's a, another tool, you may want to have that notification go to somebody who manages the tool and say, hey, by the way, there was an alert that was generated and it created a ticket. But that ability means that your monitoring solutions can start cutting tickets. Just be cautious when you turn that on, obviously, right? Be careful what you wish for. I wish that every event was a ticket. Oh boy. And then next morning, you know, you have 2,000 tickets that were really ignorable events, but it created them anyway. So yeah, that's it's a good thing, just a double-edged sword. Integration with other data sources. If you have data that comes from other places in your organization, it might be important to have that data join the ticketing data so that you don't have to recreate the data again. There's nothing worse than a really wet data model where 15 people enter the same things and we have that same information about something or someone stored in you know 10 different places. If we do, why not just pull it from the places that are the sources of truth and merge the data into a ticket, for example? So can it pull that data from the sources? And most tools can. Does it integrate with email? I can't think of a tool that doesn't. They all have the ability to email in and cut a ticket. Providing customer input, of course, that level of customer interaction is something that most tools let you choose. So you can decide how much or little you want the customer to do or see, again, in most of them. But if your customer is eventually going to become a self-service customer, that's the thing to think about. How self-servicey will they be? What kind of stuff are they going to have access to? Mobile integration, if your tool is web-based, then it's already available on the handheld device, no app required. And remember, I mean, the difference between web and app, obviously, you know, I, I certainly use Outlook. Myself, I don't use OWA, although I could, because I do like the robustness of that. But when I'm on my phone, for example, the functionality of most of the web pages feels like I'm working in an app. Sliders and dials and widgets and knobs, and it all scales nicely from my screen size. So it feels great, works fine on, on mobile devices. Most web-based tools do not need an app to be able to make them function, but some have them. So it just depends on whether that's that's an important factor for you or not. From a configuration standpoint, remember we talked about tools can be configured or customized if they're code-based, but if it's configuration, does it have a WYSIWYG? It's an old term, right? What you see is what you get. It's basically just saying, is it a rich text editor? Can you create the functionalities on the screen and have it kind of mock up and look like what that form might look like if people were seeing it? Can you do that? Are the fields customizable or are you stuck with the fields in the tool? Or do you have a limit to the fields that you can customize? Most databases, like SQL, can hold six septillion records. So there's no limit on the database side for most of that stuff for how many things you can store. It's just whether the tool is limiting you or not and whether that matters to you, if it does, right? Does it allow for workflow? So point and click tools that allow for workflow are a big bonus because now you can use some high powered stuff, right? You can sort of morph those pre predefined sentences into some detail about where does that ticket go, depending on the kind of ticket that it is, right? Where will it live in its life cycle? Can the tool decide that for me in an easy way? Maybe I can just draw it with my mouse or drag it with my mouse. Does it have a business rule engine? Things that we do in our tool sets, especially for IT, oftentimes have to happen on a particularly tight timeline. And oftentimes, because we are human beings, that timeline gives way to the other 15 things that were also the number one priority for that day. So as a result, we don't always remember, all, oh man, I was supposed to have closed that ticket yesterday. Right? That's the kind of thing that dawns on you at nine o'clock at night when you're going to bed. 
So those business rule engines to send those reminders and to make sure that tickets are reassigned to the right people and to update customers about things are important. I need to be able to tell them that stuff so I don't have to have someone hawking every ticket and going, okay, did you send a reminder on that? How about now? Right? Did you change the assignment on, on those? Did you tell them about it? How about now? That kind of stuff would just be overwhelming for a person. So you want the tool to be able to automate those things, and if it's a point-and-click tool, it can automate them pretty easily because you don't have any code to make it work. That knowledge management piece that we talked about as a sign, well, can I configure the tool to manage the knowledge that I need to manage? Even if I never released the knowledge to my end customers, and think about that for a minute, right? Because you as a customer, depending on what you're doing and depending on how geeky you are, some of you may not want to admit it, but you, you might be closet geeks. You might, you might do that stuff at home. That's cool by me. But if you do geek out a little, you might go to TechNet on your own and say, I'm going to fix this issue. But many of the customers that we service are not that level of geek. They just wouldn't do that. They'd never look at TechNet. And if they wouldn't, then the idea of a help file in front of them on what to do is, you know, like instructions for the ready-to-assemble furniture that went out with the box. They're not going to look at it. So even if the knowledge in the tool is just created for the purpose of your technicians can have answers to things quickly, then it's fulfilling a role. And if it doesn't do that, even if it just becomes a repository for it, didn't Bob use an auto to do that? Yeah, but he left, didn't he? Yeah. Right? When Bob leaves, the knowledge about Bob's stuff can go inside the tool. You can reference it when you need it, even if that only comes up once in a blue moon, which we just had, by the way. So features from a data perspective. If we talk about data features, can I include things like attachments? That's data. Now, some tools will let you search attachments, others will not, depending on what the tool's capable of. Usually client-based tools let you do that, and web-based tools don't, but that's not always a hard and fast rule. But can it search through the attachments? Can it track time? Time might be important because I need to know how long you're spending on servicing these issues because we're trying to get more efficient and it doesn't seem like those are things that should take very long. Why did they take so long? Can I search the data? Can I find out any of this information that I'm gathering? Some tools will let them you know, display data that they come shipped with, but adding your own data means, oh, you, uh, you can't really search for that if you use the tools reporting because the tool is designed to report on the fields it knows about, and that's how the reports are built, and that's really what you get. Some tools are that way. So can you search for all the fields or only the fields that it came with? Most modern tools, certainly the stuff that we represent is searchable for your data. But there are tools out there that you should be wary of. And that means reporting, right, because no report can happen without first searching. I've got to be able to find the tickets first and then say, yeah, I'm going to put them in a report and slice and dice them the following way. At first, I slice them by saying, I only want yesterday's tickets or last month's tickets from a search perspective. And then, does the tool provide any analytics? Now, most IT-type tools are not big on analytics. Right? They're not big on cube solving and saying, I predict that next week, next week Tuesday, you're going to have an influx of, of data and people. But you can certainly use tools that do those kind of cube solves and spot those kinds of trends. Most tools have databases behind them that are fully mineable by that kind of data analysis solution. But if it's vitally important to the tool yourself have it, then that immediately starts narrowing the choices you can make because there's not a lot of IPSM tools that do deep sort of cube solve type predictive analysis. And if they do, it'll, it'll It'll be reflected in the price tag, I'll put it that way. Data exports. Can you get the data out of the tool? That, too, might be important. Uh, data, data coming out equals data going in, though. So you got to remember you can't pull data out of the tool that you never gathered to begin with when you design your reports. And this is all stuff that we at Flycast work with you on when we work with you to build any of these things, right? When you design a report, you're thinking about data you're getting out of the tool. Yeah, and then we'll have this field, and then we'll divide it out by this. And then you go back and look and go, wow, we're not dividing it out by that, are we? We're, we're not even capturing that data at all. So you can only slice and dice the data in ways in which you've provided data for the slicing and dicing. If you've captured the info, most tools will let you get through that information and at least find that detail. 
And if you can export the data into another solution in case your tool can't do it, then that means you have access to this data even in you know, more powerful, specifically built for purpose analysis tools. Support. How do I administer the tool? If it's point and click, I know, right? if it's codeless, but what kind of code does the person who's using the tool have to learn or know if it's not a codeless tool? Right? And who, who will I have make changes to it? Th these are the kinds of things that will oftentimes stack up, and many of you may have been in situations like this where there's a big laundry list that someone keeps of all the changes that someone wishes could be made to the tool. We need a report to be run for the following thing. But to get that run, you have to go through you know, the developer. So they got a laundry list as long as your arm of things that they're supposed to get developed sometime in the tool that people are asking for. And meanwhile, you wait without that data until it finally churns through the, the, the process. Or you get the vendor to come out to do it. And as a vendor, we, we don't mind coming out to do that at all, right? We'll work with you. But sometimes it's not as convenient for you as a customer to, to have to do that. So codeless tools certainly have a place in the organization. So do the others, right? Obviously, they're some of those big gun tools that are that kind of finely tuned are awesome. They're very powerful guns and usually designed to take down big prey. The, the tools that are point and click can often take down big prey because they're also geared for that kind of audience, but they're easier to access. Is it web-based, so can I do it from my phone or iPad? That might be important too. Right? Or do I need to have a separate client just to administer the tool? Maybe that doesn't matter, but some tools are, are structured that way too. Professional services involved. Now, you know, as folks who provide professional services, we can tell you this, and I can speak from my own experience just doing things around my house. I'm one of those people that likes to do things and experiment and find out the hard way if I can or can't do that thing. Right? But when you're doing something inside of a tool, trying to figure it out on your own, even if it's a point and click tool, usually the first way you find that solves the issue, hey, I couldn't figure out how to do this, but I finally figured it out. Awesome, and now I'm able to do it. The first way you find is the way that you think the tool does it. It's not necessarily the best way to do it. There may be an automated way in the tool to handle that without what you just did, but you invented a way and that's the way you're gonna do it. So from a professional services standpoint, especially for tools that are point and click, but even for others, because who has time to develop in those things, right? Training on learning how the tool operates means that you can point and click your way to setting up all the rest of the functions in the tool and you don't need to ever come back to the vendor for any of that stuff. We'll see you when we need some licenses or when we call you for support or whatever. That way, you can kind of take charge of the tool. Code-based tools, a little more difficult. You have to have staff on hand or, you know, your, your vendor is building most of that stuff for you. But all of those things, of course, you know, come with costs associated. So oftentimes cheaper to do it. Professional services is the way to go in either case, just to make sure you know what the heck the tool is capable of delivering for you, right? Especially if it's codeless. And if it's not, just so that you can have somebody build that stuff so that you and your teammates don't have to be entrenched in this project that you don't have time for in the middle of the three other projects that you're working on. Let somebody else build that. They'll come to you and say it's done. We can handle all that stuff. From a support staff standpoint, what does it take to support the tool? What percentage of an FTE or how many FTEs, if there are more than one of them, might it take to make the tool live and breathe in the organization? If you have one developer and you have a list that's as long as their arm, that could be a problem if you have a tool that needs code. So just a thing to think about. But even drag and drop stuff, right? That still takes time. It's less time, but it's still time. Point and click interfaces absolutely have time involved in them from thinking through what the process should look like to actually pointing and clicking, right? Doing, doing all that stuff. Are there community forums out there that help support the tool, right? Does the vendor have that community support? Is it the vendor and the developer of the solution? Who is it? So that you have ways to turn to say, hey, I have an idea for your tool. I have a new capability I want you to be able to use or to develop. And other people can say, you know what, me too. I would love to see that. And that kind of community is how many of, of, of our folks w w that we work with will develop and, and turn the direction of the tools that they're working on and deliver them to us because the customers feed back information to them and that helps them shape what the tool and solution looks like. So very, very important and a great way to get your favorite feature installed in the tool. Some more general features, guys, do they support social media? You know, that was a big spurt in tools for a while. We've seen that become less of a big flag wave event 
for a while there, it was, oh, we're going to have to incorporate social media integration with all of our solutions. It, it caught on some in college campuses in particular, but less so in the corporate world. But that's a thing. It's certainly a thing that is available in some of these tools. You have to decide if it's important. Even if not, are there other channels through which I can make requests, right? Can I email in, right? Can I, can I phone call? Can, can it screen pop my caller information, my caller ID? Can it pull that information out? Trick emerging. Do I have a way of saying all four of these things are the same thing, just from four different people? And then close one of them so that all of them close. That kind of ability, that's part of the function of what the service desk does, right? They type and match. They type the issue by categorizing it. They match it with other issues to say, bigger than a bread box already. This is now the eighth call we've had about this same thing. I think we got something going on, guys. Merge them together, close one of the issues. They all, they all close. Multi-process support. So can I make my changes and my incident records talk together? I can't imagine tools in the modern day and age not doing that, but it's important to think about. And the other thing that's important to think about is many of these tools, you know, behave like workflow engines, right? They're they're very powerful under the hood for not just IT process, but almost any process. So do you have other processes that you might be kicking around in a, you know, in a PDF document or in a Word document that you could then incorporate into these other solutions and say, well, I want to put the form in here and automate it. If you have a, a codeless tool, you don't need to get anybody to develop it. You can kind of point and make your way through that. Finally, do you have divisions of the company or organization, colleges this is huge for, I but certainly managed service providers too, where the College of Fine Arts and the College of Computer Science cannot see each other's tickets and shouldn't. The system needs to keep everybody separate. Facilities, you have your own place in the tool to come work. Nobody sees your tickets, you can't see anybody else's. You don't even know the ticketing system supports anybody else because all you see is the stuff that comes to you. Tools certainly exists that can do that, let you fully segregate that data and still give everybody in the system their own feel for their own slice of work, right? Their own day in the life without having the streams cross ever unless your processes say, you know what, you two really should be working together as teams. We're going to allow your tickets to cross over between work areas inside of the tool, for example. So that data segregation can also be data integration. Just depends on what you need the tool to do. So where to start? The big wheel out here, right, with policies and setting a budget and process. Honestly, start at the top with policy. Policies are the laws that you should follow. Process eventually gets built to help you adhere to those laws, right? It, it snakes you through those policies and says, here's the best way to achieve the policies and goals that we have stated. Here's the easiest process to follow. Here's the easiest line through the snow. But you need executive support in the middle of that for those policies to say this is what we're going to move forward with. So when you are producing the documentation and producing the information about what you want for a tool, right, at least even if it's on the back of a napkin, you still want to eventually pass that in front of somebody that says this is what we're doing. This is what we want to do from an organizational standpoint so you can get folks to have your back. Then develop your processes. Then develop a mission statement inside that says, you know, the reason we're getting this tool is because blah, 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 blah. This is what we want to achieve. And then you can set a budget. And then you can step out of this circle and go look at tools. <laughs> but unless you have all these pieces working in place, the tool shouldn't come in there. And oftentimes people bring that tool into bear before the process even happens, right? They try to wedge it in there somewhere before they even have the process fully flushed out. Tools just enable you. You want to have your processes work it before you put them in one. Other things to think about, right? Who, who can access the data? How do you control that? Obviously, tools use databases. DBAs, therefore, have superpowers, right? They have access to the data in its raw form stored in the database. Somebody's always going to be able to look at the data for something somewhere. But can we at least make sure that the tool can shield the wrong eyes from seeing the wrong data at the wrong times? At least the end users, the agents, etc that are actually interacting with the tool. And most tools allow you to segregate that data. Some of them do it very, very well, especially with those managed service providership concepts in mind. How do you access the tool? Right. Is it easy to get access to? Do I make it available in my parking lot by opening a hole in my firewall to do that? Does the tool support that? How do you deploy it? Getting it out into people's hands is important. If you have a client server-based tool, then you have to keep the client updated too. So how do you how do you do that? 
as well as get the original client on people's desktops if it's that. If it's a web browser based, you've already got a web browser out there, so you're probably good. Organizational branding, can I at least get my logo in the corner on the tool? I have a place to put that. Some tools will let you change colors as well, or theme them at least to match kind of color schemes. And of course, best practices. Obviously, we want the tool to support the stuff we're thinking in our heads. That isn't necessarily best practice, but it is stuff we're thinking in our heads, it's stuff we want to do. There may be a best practice way of achieving that. If I were building a factory, I probably would not lay out all of the end-to-end -end work, you know, the automation myself. I'd get somebody who does that for a living, say, hey, I have no idea about how to build this factory, but I know what I want as the output. So help, help me build the automation along the way. So those best practices will come from your own work experiences, but we certainly can bring our own best practices because there are best practices for how this stuff should be done, especially along IT lines. And we bring those to bear, giving everybody that we work with the right of first refusal on that. That way we can tell you this is a good way to do it and you don't have to, you have to accept that. But will the tool support that is the big question or must it drive you down the process that it thinks you should follow? And there are certainly tools out there, folks, that will do exactly that, right? They they will dictate to you the process. Some people look at that and go, oh, look, it's already done out of the box. Isn't that convenient? Yeah, but it's not, It's built by a software vendor who doesn't have a clue as to how your business works. Right? Not a clue. And you could say, oh, but those best practices, as long as they do that. But you may have, and every organization I've talked to believes they do have, unique business wrinkles that say, oh, that, that isn't going to work for us. So having that stuff all pre-built, is great, but having the tool able to support those best practices either pre-built or because we've come up with them on our own for our own processes, is gonna be vital for you. So some key things to remember, right? It isn't intended to tell you what your process is. Tools that are pre-configured and don't have anywhere else to go are the tools, honestly, that we find ourselves working with customers to replace because the tool will only tell you what to do. You can't tell it what to do. The old adage of if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. There may be a point at which you say, you know, I'm sick of getting what I've always gotten. I want to get something different. <laughs> I want it to be different than it is. That starts with behavioral change too, right? Organizational behavioral change. Tomorrow I come in and do things differently in this way. But you need a place to be able to, to rest those ideas, a place to be able to encompass them. And the tool is usually where that, that reality comes to, comes to pass. Meaningful reporting is based on missions, goals, KPIs, and not just data that you have. If you don't have a mission for your process, then I have no way to say what the goals are. If I have no goals, then I have no way to, to tell me if I'm achieving them. And if I can't tell me if I'm achieving the goals, then why did I build the process? Missions are what all reports are aimed at. I'm achieving the mission. The mission is to rescue the hostage. The goal is to achieve this particular waypoint by 0900 hours. The report says I'm not there yet. If I have no mission or goal, it makes it really tough. So don't just produce reports because you have data. Oh, look, lovely, it's 3D. The chart is 3D, if that helps. Ease of use and ease of setup will go a long way, right? Other tools, like we said, script-based tools, absolutely have a place. They are in some of the biggest organizations on the planet. Again, because you can control every molecule of what the tool does. And because those folks usually can afford to have staff that maintain those tools in-house, a whole division. But when we're trying to do it for most of the normal size folks in the organizations that we typically see out there, right? The regular shops, even the small, you know, single mom and pop shops, we need ease of setup. I don't want to have to spend a lot of money on doing the setup of the tool. I just want it to be able to behave the way I want and to deliver the data that I'd like. So everybody, this is me saying thank you, or Gilda, saying thank you for taking time out of your day to attend. Hopefully this was beneficial for you. And we look forward to seeing you on some of the other webcasts that Rich has scheduled for me over the course of the next month or so. So. If I don't see you before, hopefully I'll see you on one of those sessions. Thanks very much. I'll turn this back to Mr. Richard Longo. Thank you again, Greg, for another fantastic presentation. Uh, pretty enlightening. Uh, I want to thank everyone who attended our presentation today for taking time out of your busy day. Please, if you have any questions, don't 
uh, hesitate to reach out to us at 844 FlyCast. That's 844 359 2278. Or simply email us at info at flycastpartners.com. That's info at flycastpartners.com. Or chat with us on our website. Uh, we have ITSM specialists standing by. They'll be happy to chat uh, with you during normal business hours. Check out our website for additional upcoming events, both live events as well as webinars, the virtual events. Uh, I encourage you to sign up and look at some of the upcoming coming classes and courses that we have as well. With that being said, I'm going to wish everyone a great week and enjoy your weekend, folks. Until next time.